Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the people who be coming into the study today. I ask you to bless us, guide us through this study, and teach us the things you want us to know about yourself and about um, your scriptures. Uh, bring us to understanding about these things so that we may be able to represent you more well and and um, in a way that brings honor to you and glory to you. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here, say hello. Um, let me know you're here because Facebook doesn't allow me to know that. And uh, it's the only way I know to find out who's, who's actually at the study. So I know a couple of people aren't going to be able to make it today. Hey, Gary, um, because of some work stuff. Um, so it's good to see you, Gary. I'm glad you're here. So um, let's get into it. So today we are in um, the second half of Romans 8, verse 13. And um, let's see. I've been doing some study here, so my scriptures aren't all lined up here. Romans 8, 13. So I hope you're doing okay today. Romans 8, 13. So, so here we have in verse 12, he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Okay, I want, I want to just put verse 11 in here. Romans 8, 11 says this. It says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. He says in verse 12, and we're in verse 13, but in verse 12 it says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Hey, Tina, seems like forever since I last saw you. Um, we're in verse 13 now. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And now in the second half is where we are right now. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live. Why? Why if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live? Because living by the Spirit yields life. It, it, it yields life in us. Um, and so there's a dynamic here that many don't understand because hardly anyone teaches this in the body of Christ. And it just amazed me. When I went to Colorado in 1992, in June of 1992, I had a master's in, in biblical counseling. I had studied Romans. I had studied Hebrews and, and a lot of other books of the Bible on my own, but I take some formal classes in those too. And I was amazed at what I was learning, having paid attention in sermons and had taught Bible studies, how much wasn't talked about from the pulpit and some of the things that seem to be to be so important. And hardly anybody teaches these things. When we make choices to trust the flesh, to supply our needs and protect us, we are forced to do things which we are convinced will make us okay. We're forced to manipulate, to, we're forced to always be on our toes, to, to never relax, to always be worried about things and, and you know try to be our own provider. And when we do that, we do it because we think it's going to make us okay. And these are like a personal toolkit which we develop in our lives and we 
employ in order to survive without God's help, as if God really wasn't available. And so even if we're born again, if we still operate after the flesh, we're still going to act as if God really wasn't in our life. And there's a lot of our brothers and sisters who live this way, who constantly live this way. And so because of that, um, Lord is asking me a question. Um, we we sometimes and often really look as if we're not born again at all. Now the Bible calls these tools the deeds of the body. And that was in Romans 8.13 when he said, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And this emphasizes a focus, the deeds of the body emphasize a focus on the earthly rather than the heavenly. Or, or in Galatians 5, we're going to see in a second here, that these are also referred to as the deeds of the flesh. So I'm going to quote this um, from the scriptures. So, so from Galatians 5, 19 to 21, The scripture says this. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can add, ask these. I'm just asking Lord to do something. My blood sugar's dropping a little bit, so I'm asking Lori to bring me something. She's going to be on the radio tonight. She's my uh, surprise guest on the radio tonight. And so here in this verse, it says, Now the works of the flesh, and that's out of the, um, the, the, the uh, New King James. Out of the New America Standard, it says, The deeds of the flesh. Um, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. And so as you go through them, there's a whole list of behaviors. So, in the last bit, when I said, when we're living according to the flesh, we have to do things which we're convinced will make us okay. Well, here's some of the things that well, lost people do all the time, but you'll notice in the body of Christ, many of us Christians will do these same behaviors, and it's because we think we have to, because we're trying to protect ourselves and try and to uh, provide for ourselves. Listen to this list. Adultery. You know, there's a lot of adultery in the body of Christ. There's a lot of fornication in the body of Christ. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. Where people worship money, will worship other people. Um, um, let me see. Oh, it's not you, Gary. I forgot to put my, my microphone in front of me. I'm sorry. Is this better? Um, is this better now? Um, okay, I'm sorry. My microphone was way over there. Now it's right in front of me again. I, um, I'm sorry about that. Um, but listen to this. The works of the flesh are evident. And, and the, the whole world lives this way because most of the world is lost. Um, but, but many in the body of Christ will do this. So what we'll see is somebody will fall to immorality. Often we'll see this um, in leadership because they're high and lifted up. Uh, and so they become more. Just last week, someone in the DFW area, a famous preacher who has spoken at Promise Keepers as the keynote speaker, um, has stepped down because of of uh, sin. Didn't say what was, but it's going to be in this list, right? And so we'll see this in the body of Christ too. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Now what the heck is sorcery? It's trying to manipulate people's souls. And you see this with manipulation. Uh, someone was talking yesterday about how a relative was saying 
stuff and and everything they were saying was designed to make a spike in emotions in someone else's soul it was to control someone else's soul that is witchcraft and sorcery hatred there's a lot of hatred in the body of Christ uh, contentions jealousies outbursts of wrath selfish ambitions dissensions heresies envy murders drunkenness revelries and the like and the like means there's a whole bunch of others and he says, just as I also told you in the past that those who practice such things don't inherit the kingdom of God. Well, as we're going to go, I was writing this in, in, as we got further on in Romans chapter 8. The, um, the kingdom of God isn't about going to heaven. It's about whether or not God's order um, occurs in a person's life. So what happens is, our life will be out of order. Our life... I can hear the door open out there. Our life will be out of order. And so what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll do stuff in the flesh to try to bring our own order to it. And it'll cause more disorder to come. And so we won't inherit the kingdom of God. We won't inherit God's order in our life. Why? Because we're busy trying to manipulate people or uh, with outbursts of anger or intimidate and do all these different things. And you can see how the spiral continues. And so, so um, the things that we have to do in the flesh, we don't really have to do it. We'll just trust God. We don't have to do it in the flesh. We don't have to trust God uh, if we try to do it in our flesh. But what we bring is is all kind of disorder into life. And so we don't have to trust the flesh. We can surrender the flesh. And that's why Romans uh, 8.13 said, But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you're going to experience life. You'll, you know, the, that word evident, he says, Now the, the works of the flesh... Well, evident in Galatians chapter 5 19 it's interesting it means shining in other words when we choose and, and a lot of people do this undercover it's as if we don't eat well first off a lot of us don't know that we're operating in the flesh because we're kind of on autopilot right we're just trying to do stuff that we've always done to somehow try to manage our lives without God's help and so, uh, and, and often we'll do it in the body of Christ thinking we're getting away with something. But the scripture says that the works of the flesh or the deeds of the flesh are evident. They shine. They're really loud. They're really bright. And they stand out. And so because they stand out, we're not getting away with anything. And so often I'll be, I, I was in a meeting in a congregation once. There was a, there was a person in the congregation who was manipulating the leader of the congregation. And to this day, I don't think he, he, he knows that he was played, you know. And, and so we had a meeting. And in the meeting, this lady was doing blatant things to try to control the meeting and control my soul. And she was trying to provoke me. And I thought it was just so ridiculous how blatant it was. But since... Almost everybody else at the table everybody else at the table was operating in the flesh. Nobody could see really what she was doing in the flesh. She was trying to provoke me to wrath and eventually she blew up and she, it, it blew up on her and, and to this she probably doesn't know it, but it wasn't going to yield any life whatsoever and was trying to get me to be defensive and I wasn't going to be defensive because I don't have to protect myself because I'm trying to walk after the spirit and I believe the the Lord is my protector so we didn't have to do all that foolishness hey Liz it's good to see you. and so we didn't have to do this I was experiencing life everybody else at the table is experiencing death I had two people that are a pastor and I think they were walking after the spirit too because we, I cautioned them, they are going to try to provoke us. We can't be controlled by anybody else. I have a watchword, and that is, I'm not gonna, 
allow my, to the best of my ability, I'm not going to allow my soul to be controlled by anybody that didn't die on a cross for me. And only Jesus died on a cross for me. So I wasn't going to let this person, I don't care what their credentials were or what their title was, they're not going to control my soul. And I, I pray that we'll all live that way. And the only way we can live that way is to be consciously aware that God can provide and protect us so we don't have to do that for ourselves. We don't have to do these deeds or these things. We don't have to do these works. Because God is in control of our life. He's our provider. He's our protector. So how exactly does a person, and I'm going to quote that verse again because I've spoken a bunch of words. Um, Gary has seen me in operation doing this in a different meeting in the same place where the guy tried to provoke me. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not playing this game. You know, he says, if by the spirit you put the deeds, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How exactly does a person put to death the deeds of the body? By How do we do this? Well, how about by disuse? How, how about we, we give you an analogy? Ima so here's an analogy. Imagine a person who is habituated to using a drug regularly. They're pre perhaps they're even addicted to this drug. And eventually that person will identify as a drug user or a drug addict. And his behaviors and practices will cause him to see himself in terms of this tool that he's using, this drug. And not just buying the drug and using the drug, but also all the secondary behaviors which accompany that, such as deception and sneakiness, maybe even theft, right? So they see themselves in terms of being an addict or a drug user because the tool they've chosen now identifies them and now comes with its own set of behaviors that they adopt. Now imagine that person is freed from the drug. He puts to death the drug. And that's a good thing. So that's a pretty good start that you put to death the using of the drug in your life. And so you, you think to yourself, I don't need this tool anymore. But there's more. He might find himself still hiding things, or lying and or stealing. Why? Because he hasn't put to death the deeds of the body, which go along with drug use and addiction. And what is that? And I think there are three primary reasons. Um, why is that? I think there's three primary reasons, and really the first two lead to the third reason. So let's look at those. So the first is he might be on autopilot, still doing things he had to do from before he put to death the drug use. The second is he still thinks these behaviors are a part of who he is. And then the third is that he still sees himself in terms of being a drug user or a drug addict, and that's identity, right? So if by the Spirit you put the deeds of death of the body, you will live. What does all that have to do with Romans 13b? Well, it has everything to do with it. Many of us have never thought that the person we were prior to being saved, the Bible calls us the old man, have never been taught that they were crucified with Christ. So here we have, and we looked at this when we were looking at Romans chapter 6, but it's been a while, and might be someone in here. Remember, if you come into Bible study, please say hi so I'll know you're here, because I can't tell who joins the Bible study or who leaves the Bible study. So back in Romans 6, we saw this. For if we have been united together in the likeness of Jesus' death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this fact that our old man was crucified with Christ, bonsoir Marie, um, that the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. And since many of us in the body of Christ have no idea this happened to us the instant we were born again, we still live as if we needed the deeds 
of the body, which was the toolkit which the old man employed for survival and protection. These are still on autopilot, as it were, still doing things they had to do from before putting to death the old man. And they still think those behaviors are a part of who they are. And they still see themselves in terms of the old man who died with Jesus. And you'll hear this. You'll hear this all, just as a normal way that a lot of believers will speak about themselves. They'll say, well, I'm, always, I'm, I'm a jealous person, or I'm an impatient person, or I'm an angry person, or I'm, um, it's hard for me to wait, or all that kind of stuff. And really, that is the old man's identity as an impatient, angry, selfish, or whatever, you know. This is just the way I am. And I really... I don't want anybody to walk on eggshells around me. Hey, Melissa Myers. I don't want people to walk on eggshells around me, but I really hate it when people say stuff like that. Because what they're doing is, is they're in reinforcing a false identity based on someone who died. I mean, imagine if you really died the moment you were born again with Christ and then you really came alive as a new person when you rose and were resurrected with Jesus. And this isn't a, a case of imagine it so that you'll convince yourself it's true, even though it really wasn't. It's, it's a, imagine that because it's true. And you can begin to live it out more automatically and, and more instinctively. Because this is the reality. A lot of the stuff that happens in the institutional church and often also in house church, hey Joe, it's good to see you, um, is reinforcing identities from the old man that don't even exist anymore because the old man died. There's a lot of sermons that are built around enforcing who you are as someone who died and trying to equip people in their flesh to overcome someone that they're not ever going to ever be anymore anyway. Isn't that ridiculous? It's the truth. It's what happens in the body of Christ all the time. And because of that, we leave. And it's like it never made an effect on us because it's talking to a dead person, not to the person you are alive in Christ. And so that's why so many of us live as if we're on autopilot because we're on autopilot, but the person that we're trying to live in autopilot is dead. Can you imagine how much this delights Satan, who is a liar, to have Christians believing these untruths and living these untruths? They're lies. He says, however, if you do put to death the deeds of the body, that not only signals you no longer feel a need to do them, but also opens your heart up to receiving the spiritual life which comes along and only through trusting God for everyday life, for moment-to-moment -moment life. We're not in control of anything but our own ability to turn to the Lord. We're really not in control of anything but that. We're either going to trust in the Lord and all these things obey unto us, or we're going to trust in the flesh, which eventually leads back to Satan's promptings and the death that he deals out. And, and so it's important, and you know, I constantly think about, this is in my mind all the time, the reality that I was crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. Galatians 2.20, it's now Christ who lives in me because I died with him. I constantly have that in the back of my mind because I don't want to employ a dead man's tools to try to survive when I have this life from Christ available to me. 
This is why I don't let people control my soul. Because if they do, I'm going to go to the deeds of the flesh. I'm going to go, you know, in my shed at home right now, I have a toolbox. It's an old craftsman toolbox. It's rusty. It has some of my dad's tools in there. It was, I think it was his toolbox. It has two shelves in it that I can pull out. Um, I never go in that toolbox because I have gotten another toolbox. It's actually supposed to ride in my vehicle when I get another vehicle. I'm gonna put it in the back of, the, of a Jeep that I hope to get soon. And, and uh, it has clean tools, they're not rusty. They're all there. They're all designed for me to use, my tools. The tools that are there, they belong to a dead man, the one in the old toolkit. He's not alive anymore. That's a dead man's tools. And I want to use a toolkit that the Lord has given me. Now in my new life toolbox, your toolbox, that you have one just like it, there's one thing in there. You know, you know those commercials. You know that come on in the middle of the night. It's just one tool to do everything. You can you can break ice with it. You can open up things like a screwdriver. It's like a Leatherman tool. One tool. Our one tool is this: trust the Lord. Walk after the Spirit, and you will experience the life of God. So Romans eight thirteen said. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. I'm going to paste that for the newcomers. If you live according to the flesh, if you live in obedience to something that Satan wants us to use, you're going to experience death. But if by the Spirit, in other words, you don't put the deeds to death the deeds of the Spirit. You stop using the tools because the Spirit of God provokes you to trust Him instead. Then you will live. So here in one verse, in one verse, did you see that? That was my my pop filter from my my microphone. It was now where it belongs. Uh, um, I hit it with my hand with my Cajun gestures. Um, here in one verse, we have both choices. The sensation of spiritual death and the reality of spiritual Zoe life. And this reminds me of a, of a famous verse in the Old Testament. It's rather long. It's, um, it's Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 through 20. But I'm going to post the whole thing here and read through it and emphasize some parts of it because I think this is very important for us. And it's important because way back, Moses writes this, way back in Deuteronomy 30. And God hasn't changed. You know, if God did it for you once, he's still that way. He's still God. He's still the same way. And he'll be God in the future. He says, this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you. It's not beyond your ability to understand. Nor is it fall off, far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it. It's not distant. He says, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. It's close by. Now for us, it's literally in our hearts because the word of God is written on our hearts, the scripture says. He says, see, I have set before you today Two things, just two choices. Life, and uh, I have set before you today, life and good, death and evil. In, in that I command you today to love your, the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. 
for a purpose. That's what that means. That you may live and multiply. And the Lord God will bless you in the land into which, which you go to possess. So wherever you are in your life right now, whatever's coming, whether it's a new job or a new home or it's a new um, provision that God has in order for you or a new situation or tomorrow or you're going to like we're going to have two, two new grandchildren soon. My, my son and his wife have a little girl. Our son and his wife have a little girl and they're going to have two little boys, twins. And, and that's a big question mark for them. That's a new land which they're going to possess. Whatever the, whatever's coming is the land that we're going to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and you're drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you will surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you two things, life and death. Or we can look at it this way, blessing and cursing. Then he says, therefore, choose life so that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, cling to him, I love that, for he is your life, and he is the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. God has intentions for us, he wants us to step into those intentions, into our inheritances. He has, a, he has, they're the same in that they're blessings and life. They're different in that you have a unique one and I have a unique one that's fine-tuned to God's intentions for this unique individual and for you as unique individuals. He has the same thing in plan. It is powerful, Tina. This is, this is the, I think about this all the time it it takes away all my doubt it takes away my fear it takes away my anxiety it takes away my doubts because he hasn't changed at all has he god is the same yesterday he says in hebrews jesus is the same yesterday today and forever he he's the same he doesn't change he never varies He's not like light. He never varies. There's never shades in there. He's always the same. So Paul moves along in his letter into verse 14. And I'm sorry if, well, no, I'm not. I'm intense. And I'm intense because I believe this with all my heart. And this is, the teaching is equipping. You know, in, in the New Testament, the sermons... They're all evangelist sermons to lost people. What, what we get in the body of Christ is not sermons. It's not preaching. Not in the scriptures anyway. We, we hear it in the culture of the church. But, but, but in, the, in the scriptures, what we have is teaching. He says, go and make disciples in Matthew 28, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Make disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them all things. So teaching this, therefore equipping the saints. And that's why in, in Ephesians uh, 4, it says that God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and, and um, uh, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. How did I forget that one? Um, to equip. So these are equipping things. And I'm, I'm passionate about it because if we allow ourselves to be equipped with these things, then the devil and all the stuff that he throws at us can't control us. We can truly walk as free beings. Um, and it's for freedom that he set us free. So so here we go to uh, to Romans 8, 14. So I'm not apologizing for being passionate. I love this stuff. And I think that if we receive this, we become much more productive 
and much harder to manipulate and control. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, as we get later on in the scripture, around verse 20, 18, 20 up in there, we're going to see that the entire creation anticipates us being revealed as the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, there's two ways to look at our situation as believers as it pertains to this verse. First, first, excuse me, let us consider something Jesus said to the Jewish leaders who were trying to set a trap for him. In John uh, chapter 8, verse 44, he said this to the Jewish leaders, not not to any believers, because there weren't any believers yet, right? We weren't. He wasn't uh, raised from the dead, so nobody was born again yet. He said this. He says to the Jewish leaders that were trying to trap him and be like a stumbling block to the others who could come to Christ later. He says, "You are you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do." He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Why was he a murderer from the beginning? Well, for the the first sin, after you know uh, all humanity died because of Adam and Eve's sin, um, Cain killed Abel, right? And he murdered him. So he he was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him, the devil. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar, and he's the father of lies, or he's the father of it. Now, were they literally sons of the devil? No. Literally, their lineage came through Abraham, you know, Isaac, and, and, and so on. However, their behavior was typified by things the devil does as a practical lifestyle, as a practiced lifestyle in particular being a liar. And their position was in, in Abraham. However, their condition was as if they were in Satan's lineage. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so even though they were in Abraham, they weren't behaving like Abraham's sons. So when, when Jesus says this to these people who are lying and setting traps and manipulating and actually walking after the flesh, he is saying, your behavior makes you look like you are actually Satan's children. And he's your father. So here in Romans 8.14, he says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So we were born again. And, and those of us who are saved were born again. And when we were, our position as believers are in Christ. Just like those Jewish leaders were in Abraham. And this means that our position is also sons of God. When we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit of God, and it becomes evident that this is our practiced lifestyle, it looks like we're sons of God. But most importantly to us, it's important that we truly are sons of God. I think we should say to ourselves, you know, that's like a preacher's trick, but I think it's a good thing to do. I don't think it's a bad thing to say out loud to ourselves, I am a, a child of God, or I am a son of God, or if you're a female, you should say, I am a daughter of God. I'm one of his children. Now, spiritual health is when our positions in Christ and our condition in Christ truly line up. This is why we feel so miserable when we're born again, but still live after the flesh. And this is the death of which Paul speaks when, when we follow the Spirit. Prior to being born again, we were in bondage to sin and death. We had no option but to walk in the flesh and worship the devil 
by practicing sin. Happily, something wonderful happened the instant we were saved. We underwent an adoption process. And that's why the next verse says this. We're covering some ground today. And this is a beautiful thing that we're fixing to talk about. He says, As many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, Romans 8, 14. Then in verse 15 he says, For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received something different. That's the reason for the but. He says he's, he's, he's contrasting what was before the but, what's after the but. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again, the fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And you know, in our culture, parents who do not take care of their children, parents who abuse them, or use them or neglect them. Um, I'm going to write that down here to put in my notes for when this is a book. Or neglect them. Well, they'll have their children seized by Child Protective Services. And if they don't comply and learn to be really good parents and take care of their children and provide for their children and sacrifice for their children, then it, sometimes their parental rights will be severed. And at times, this process can drag out for many months. One of the ladies I, I pastor and watch over her soul is a born-again, spirit-filled believer who is also a CPS worker. And so I've, you know, well, actually was a part of, of uh, God telling her she was going to be a CPS worker one day and going back to school for it. And, and so she has to unfortunately do this. Praise God that freeing us from our old spiritual parental figure is an instantaneous process. When we finally get tired of being used, abused, and neglected by the devil as an expendable in his evil kingdom, and we cry out to Jesus, we are adopted by Jesus' Father into his family immediately. I mean, let's just think about this imagery. Satan functionally was our father and he was a bad father and when we ask, when we cry out for help, God immediately rescues us from that bad parent, severs his parental rights to us. Isn't that beautiful? I just, it's really impacted me. It's impacted me more now than when I wrote my, my copy for today's teaching. He says, you did not receive a spirit of bondage to fear again. But you received the spirit of adoption. Have you noticed that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ seem to go straight from freedom, from sin and death, right back into bondage to the spirit of fear, the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of anger, the spirit of religion, and on and on? I have. Most legalistic forms of Christendom impose bondage on their adherents. I've even witnessed intelligent and faithful believers become energized when they're stomped on by the jackboots of legalistic um, religious leaders. To them, it's not good church unless they're being abused and mocked. I've had people say on Facebook post that that we were stomped on at church today. Praise God. And I'm thinking, repent. The kingdom of God is near. In stark contrast to receiving bondage is adoption into the family of God. And that is what we're going to pick up at next time when we start next week with our Bible study next week. I don't want to encourage people 
to experience more bondage that's gotten like a veneer of it's okay just because it's happening in a church building or in a house church. I don't, I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's good. Galatians chapter 5 says, you were, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Don't return again to a yoke of bondage. And so whether it's a yoke of bondage to fear, anxiety, um, doubt, and all those things, or it's, it's, it's a bondage to uh, the spirit of religion, it's still bondage. You're still in shackles. Even if it's cute church or whatever it is, it's not good. It's still bondage and it's not freedom in Christ. So let's think with this, not with this, not with our emotions, and let's approach the Lord in a way that allows us to harvest the freedom that he wants us to have. Whew. Well, I have to save something for the radio. So we're going to have to close up here for right now. Um, I'm going to be teaching um, something called on, per on Perseverance. I think it's a good thing. Thank you, uh, Tina. I appreciate your comment. I really pray through this, and I'm real excited about Romans 8. I'm, um, I'm really looking forward uh, to as we go. I'm, I'm, it seems like I'm gaining momentum. It feels like that to me. I don't know if it's that way for y'all, but that's what it feels like to me. And, and um, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So I just heard my mystery guest is coming in. She's going to be in the studio with me tonight. The one, the only, Laurie McInerney. Um, let's pray. So, Father, I thank you so much for those who take the time to be a part of our Bible study. I ask you to, um, to bless them. I ask that the things that we talked about today, that they, um, that they be good for us, that they, that they um, benefit us in such a way that they can um, be a part of our everyday life. I ask that you um, uh, bless those who are ill. I ask you to bless those who are in any kind of stress. I ask you to bless those who have um, any kind of challenges going on in everyday life. And I ask you to um, liberate us from the things that hold us back. I ask you to heal those who are sick. I ask you to be with Miss Mary Edwards who is recovering from a fall in which she, she broke her pelvis and allow her to regain all of her capabilities back. I ask you to be with, uh, with uh, Myra Dameron, who's recovering from uh, surgery, and um, hopefully she'll do better and get back home soon. I ask you to be with those who are starting new jobs soon and get them through the transition time of those things. I ask you to be with all those we love, all of our loved ones, and even the ones who d dislike us. I ask you to bless them. I know that there's one man, I'm not going to mention my name because I don't have permission to do that, who recently fell and is, is, is trying to um, regain his strength so that he can walk again and not, not be in a wheelchair. I ask you to be with him and his wife and his family uh, because I know it's frustrating to be in that place. And allow him to regain his ability to get around and, and make his income. And I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember that um, that you can watch these videos on YouTube. This is an easy link to that. Uh, I, I also um, um, remind you that there's a bunch of articles in this place that you can go to. Um, I think right now I might have a little bit of a um, problem with, with my... Um, Website. I'm trying to call it up, and I'm not. I'm not seeing it uh, pop up. I think I'm having some kind of. I don't know what it is. A gateway problem. We'll figure it out. Um, we also um, have our Bible study that we're about to do on you. Uh, TruthSeekerTexasRadio.com. Uh, this is the the link for that that you can uh, always go to and and watch from your. Uh, laptop, uh, whatever your device is, phone, uh, tablet, or whatever it is, and and you can um, you can go to that at any time, and and uh, even call in. So if you want to call in, I know um, several of the people that are in the room right now have called in to our Bible studies, 
at truthseekertexasradio.com. And this is the, the uh, phone number for that, so you can call in and be on the air and ask questions or, or comment on what we're talking about. So um, that's the right word. So, um, Marie, that wasn't your twin, was it? It was the other sister that we visited when we were in uh, Montreal. Um, but, um, yeah, Marie and her twin sister just experienced the death of another sister in their mourning that, and that's always difficult. Um, so, um, please keep them in your prayers. Marie is our friend in Quebec, and I really love her a lot. And uh, Laurie and I went to visit them on one of our anniversaries. So anyway, I got to go. I have to get down the hall to the worldwide web headquarters of TruthSeekerTexas.com. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Thank you for being here. And we really appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.